So it is a pleasure to, to have you here. So can you please tell us about your background and your current research activity? Sure. Um, yeah, I started at uh, Lehman Brothers a couple of years ago. Um, and then after that, uh, I moved over to Nomura. So my main role is within FX Quant Strategy. So it's basically building systematic trading models for essentially trading FX spot and also FX options as well. I also do some work on gold, but it's primarily on currencies. So. So my understanding is that you're mainly doing systematic trading on FX and yeah. sometimes on gold. So what do you think are the main uh, themes driving the systematic trading activity in those markets? Sure. Well, I guess um, at the moment, one of the big themes has been uh, essentially looking at trends. So, uh, for example, dollar yen has moved a lot in the past few months. So essentially looking at systematic based strategies, which trade trends have actually done very well as a result of that move. And also in other currencies such as sterling, it's moved a long way since, since the end of the year as well. I think also going forwards, one strategy that's going to come back into fashion is the concept of FX carry. So basically okay. buying high yielding currencies funded by short, uh, short yielding currencies. And what are the currency pairs actually that makes make this um, trade more profitable at the moment? Oh, well, I'd say probably basically funding in yen in general. Funding. So funding in yen and then buying uh, currencies with high yields, such as, for example, MEX or Aussie is another one. There's been a bit of volatility in dollar yen in the past week or so, but I think over the next quarter it could be a profitable strategy buying carry. Um, and then carry-based models actually going to outperform, I think, because of that. Uh, usually, usually those kind of strategies are good, I mean, until they are they perform well. Yes. So, do you take any like, uh, um, say, um, action to hedge, like you know, some kind of risk, and uh, that uh, that you're not really planning in advance, or I mean, like, uh, so it's like yeah. or just like uh, hold things until some given deadline. Well, for example, for carry strategies, one hedge that you can employ is to actually buy um, out-of-the-money put options in high beta currencies such as Aussie. So thereby, you basically you don't remove your tail risk entirely, but you can reduce your drawdown substantially as a result of basically an out-of-the-money hedge. So you remain long carry and then have the hedge running alongside it. So it can help reduce the drawdowns. That's interesting. And regarding uh, hedging strategies, I mean, uh, do you take positions that need to be hedged a lot or do you mostly like you know uh, have a view and stick to a view and well i guess in terms of a systematic trading uh, strategy one instance where you might want to put on a discretionary hedge is for example over a big data event for example recently you had a, like a massive meeting about bank of the japan um, and that was obviously a big event risk so you could say I will just let my model trade as it would over the event, but maybe a more prudent thing is to sometimes have a, have a hedge in place. You don't, the thing is you need to make a judgment call whether an event is big enough to hedge or to let your model run. So I think a couple of times a year having a hedge on a systematic trading model actually makes, makes sense. But that becomes more a judgment call as, some, some, as opposed to something systematic. So Absolutely. Like everything, I guess. <laughs> and so you're using derivatives mostly for hedging purposes, not for investment? I'd say most people use, at least say, for example, corporates and the like, they use them more for hedging. I guess with, for example, hedge funds, in lots of the cases, they'll actually have option strategies. So they might take a punt on a specific, uh, specific moves in currencies based upon, uh, based upon FX options. Um, as opposed to the underlying because they can have uh, a bottom risk. Uh, but also you might have systematic trading strategies as well. So typically systematic trading strategies involving FX options will mostly be short, uh, basically selling options. But there you, you kind of open yourself up to, to tail risks if you run that strategy. I see. So uh, my understanding is that, as you said before, you mostly focus on FX and also a bit of gold. And uh, um, what are the main sources of risk? that you're facing in your daily daily job. So it's, uh, I mean, um, it's really like, uh, you know, the, the risk in the underlying or some like uh, uh, tail risk, as you said, some maybe yeah. event that you don't really yeah. uh, foresee. And well, I, I would say there are many different risks. I'd say one of one risk is obviously event risks and also tail risk, but also risks that um, the market will start to follow different themes, which may be the systematic trading models that you've started employing haven't really taken into account. So looking back over the past few years, for example, looking at risks in the European periphery, I think before, say, 2000 and 
2010, basically nobody looked at that type of uh, price action. But now, if you're looking at models, then maybe you might consider that this is an important thing to trade off in the future as a as a signal. So yes, uh, I understand. And um, maybe one last question because. Uh, you're pretty fast, yeah. <laughs> but it's like you're answering well to many things. So, um, so um, my understanding is that okay, you are you are combining the underlying with options on the underlying, yeah. and uh, um, this may create some challenges from the modeling point of view because yeah. you may mix like you know the so-called P measures, Q measures, yeah. whatever. And uh, is there like a, a standard way to deal with you know? Uh, say a market price of risk yeah. or I mean like uh, you know people actually take advantage of their own models to make money and be you know uh, more competitive well I, I guess there are I guess one issue is basically in terms of when you're creating your models in terms of having in sample bias so like I can run a trading model over the past 10 years of data and then basically highly fit it and then say look my model is great maybe we should actually put real money on it and encourage clients to to do that so i think the main the main risks are actually that you have too much faith in your in your model basically right so i think whenever you construct a systematic trading model you need to be uh, thinking about what types of things can go wrong and also when you're fitting the parameters there's one thing fitting them slightly, and there's another thing that you have totally different parameters for each currency pair, just so that you have a like a historical straight line, basically, in terms of your, your trading returns. So I would say the, the main thing is you obviously want to make money out of your model, but you don't want to kid yourself that your historical returns, which you've overfitted, will actually be something right. that you get in the future. Like I think if you kind of underfit a model historically, Maybe your historical returns won't, won't look so good, but I think you'll make more money out of your model going forwards because the returns will be more stable uh, from that perspective. So <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Do you want to add anything else? Well, it's been it's been a pleasure to talk to you, and thanks for your questions. Likewise. So, <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thanks very much.